Welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast bringing guests together to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. From entrepreneurs to vendors, higher education to corporate leaders, we'll uncover their perspective regarding the latest trends and technologies impacting your career or business. Our podcast is made possible by Downing EdTech Consulting, where people and technology connect. Hosted by Cher Downing, an experienced executive spanning a higher education and corporate career with specific focus on the EdTech industry. Dr. Downing is also an international and national presenter, author, and regular media contributor. Now here is your host, EdTech strategist, Dr. Cher Downing. Hi, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast where we bring guests to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. Our goal is to provide you with options for products, services, and knowledge that can help benefit you or your business. I'm Cher Downing, your host, and I want to introduce today's guest, Joe Sprangle, who is the Dean of the College of Business and Professional Studies at Mary Baldwin University and is also the Founder Principal Consultant of Emmanuel Strategic Sustainability. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Cher. I appreciate the offer to be with you today. Very excited to hear about two of the things that you're working on, one which is obviously educating future business leaders by being dean of a college of business, but that also in looking at your consulting and looking at strategic sustainability, helping businesses be successful and how all of this intersects together. So I'm going to let you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got to this point. All righty. I tell people I learned about sustainability growing up on a farm. We didn't have a whole lot. We we figured out ways to get by with what we did have. And I remember pulling nails out of boxes that my dad would bring home. So we use the boards for roofing, for example. But then I, I went into almost 30 years of manufacturing experience where I started out as a lowly machine laborer and worked my way into an apprenticeship in machine repair. I learned more there for my future success than I think I have in a lot of other areas since. How to troubleshoot, root cause analysis, how to creative problem solving, project management. The balance of most of what I did was a combination of engineering and plant manager roles. And I tell people I had a midlife crisis and decided to become an academic. So at that point, I'd had several degrees up to a master's in business administration. But as you know, from your own experience, if you want to teach at the collegiate level, you need to go out, get a doctorate, get some teaching experience. And also start to get published with some scholarly articles. And so for about four and a half years, I worked full time as a plant manager, 50, 60 hours a week, did my own coursework, taught courses for someone else, did my research and publication work, and wrote most of my dissertation driving around the countryside while my wife drove. I shouldn't say I was driving, my wife was driving. <laughs> as we went to watch our son run uh, cross country and track for Michigan State for several years. I became the the dean about four and a half years ago after teaching for about 10 years. And all of my focus really is primarily on helping businesses to become more sustainable, to have that triple bottom line approach, not only focusing on financial element, but also what can they do in order to uh, have a positive impact on the social and environmental aspects of running a business. So we integrate a lot of that into the coursework. For example, the MBA program that I developed is built around the B Impact Assessment by B Corporation. And so it focuses on the elements of customer, community, environment, governance, and the worker. And so we built courses around that. But It is a very rigorous platform where it goes through a lot of details about, are you paying a living wage? What's the breakdown between your highest and lowest paid salaries? What are you doing to track and and reduce environmental impact? What are you doing to be a, a viable member of the community in which you work? And so, as I sit here now, I've been working on transitioning out of the dean role go back to faculty for a period of time, and then launch this consulting practice, uh, manual strategic sustainability, with a focus on manufacturing in particular, given that that's a lot of my background. 
And it'll allow me to show manufacturing how they can solve some of their own issues like baby boomers retiring at the same time by making pathways for people that we would consider disadvantaged populations. So much of the the world wealth, for example, is Oxfam reports 26 individuals have the same wealth as the bottom half of the population or 3.9 billion people. So so there's, there's a lot of issues out there we can work on fixing. Absolutely. It's fascinating to me. Obviously, you and I have similar tracks in that we've been able to cross back and forth between academics and the public sector, which really is an education within itself because you learn two very different ways of running things. And so let's talk a little bit about what's at the core of social sustainability. Primarily, it's trying to live within the bounds of the earth that we live on in a lot of ways. This past practice has been to use a non-renewable resource, and we're getting to a point where that becomes more and more of a problem. At the same time, businesses are creating a lot of externalities that they don't pay for. So we can develop a combustion engine that creates pollutants that cause problems to the ozone, and the, the business itself doesn't pay for it. Society in general does, and as you're well aware, The United States is one of the worst contributors to the problems that we face with environmental and social issues around the world. I mean, a lot of businesses have chased the bottom line approach of finding where the cheapest labor is and exploiting that at the cost of the the people that they had working for them in many cases for years and years. And when a large manufacturing plant closes down, in a community, I mean, it devastates it. I, I've experienced that myself from where I lived when I uh, was growing up, for example. The good news is actually doing the right thing is actually the more financially viable thing. So the beauty of a lot of what sustainability is, part of it is sometimes just talking about it in the language that makes sense to people. It's about waste elimination. It's about maximizing and utilizing resources in the best possible manner. And so all of that works to be beneficial to not only the business and being more successful, more profitable, but it's a a funny thing, right? You have happy employees that are actively engaged and enjoy what they're doing. It's amazing how much better the customer service is or the product that gets to the customer becomes with less quality defects and and so forth. So it really is an overall win-win-win situation. I think you bring up a good point there because we're just starting to see preliminary data, but we're definitely starting to recognize that due to the pandemic, people not only are enjoying working remotely, which they didn't anticipate they would in some instances, but we're seeing a higher productivity level. And so one of the things that is starting to get tossed around, obviously research is is still raw data at this point, but the discussion is, so is productivity going up? because they're home, or is it because they're already happy employees who are now getting an added bonus? That's going to be interesting to take a look at once we're on the other side of this. Yeah, and I think the the great thing is showed us that some of these people that think human nature is to be lazy and not do anything if we're not staring over their shoulder is wrong. I mean, it's all about being actively engaged in work we enjoy and think we're making a difference. I don't know about you, but I hate working on something that isn't going to lead to some outcome that's beneficial. I have too many projects that have been put on a shelf because it didn't work out the way someone wanted it. And so it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you're happy, the people that you are working with and that are responsible to manage you are treating you appropriately, you're still going to perform. I always think back to the example, and I've experienced this in my career, I'm sure you have too, when computers became on every desktop at the workplace, the idea is if you're sitting there behind your computer eight hours a day, I know you're working. And I always say, no one ever walked behind my computer. I never saw anyone walk behind anybody else's computer. I, as a supervisor, never walked behind someone's computer. They could be watching cat videos for all I know. But there's some justification in our minds that because I see you sitting there, you're doing something as opposed to when I can't see you, that I think you're not doing anything. That's part of a, of, of a social responsibility, but also part of a sustainable process. As we're seeing now, lots of big companies let go of their real estate in deciding that this is really a better deal for them. 
Yeah, my son and his fiance both work for Geico, and they they've said, "Well, don't plan on coming back to work anytime soon because this is working out really well." So it's not a good time to be a owner of a bunch of office complexes, high rise buildings, and so forth. We're going to have to figure out how to repurpose those here shortly, I think. But yeah, as we saw in the first few months of the pandemic, the canals in Venice were suddenly clean. The air over Los Angeles was clean. And so there's so many different benefits that come out of it. And oh, by the way, people are more productive. Wow. Again, it's just a a fabulous thing that came out of this. (laughs) So do you think that there's going to be an influx of technology that's going to be directly related to environmental and social sustainability now? I mean, we've always had, obviously, work towards that. But I think, as you mentioned earlier, it's always been more of a, oh, we probably should do this, or we'll put that in next year's goal, and we might do something. Are you seeing opportunities now for technology to really take off in these areas? Yeah, there's, in particular, manufacturing, robots, and artificial intelligence, and are two of the areas that I think are going to have the biggest impact with the Internet of Things, being able to interconnect everything that's happening in a facility is going to help to understand what is going on and automatically make adjustments that are necessary to processes and to reduce quality issues, for example, because we have embedded metrology that's measuring every device or every component as it works its way through a facility. And instead of lagging indicators that we used to use where we track scrap or productivity at the end of the day or at the end of the month, that this is all real-time stuff that we can quickly react to, adjust as necessary, and reduce a lot of the waste that's occurred in the past. It used to be keep that line running because we can just rework everything, but no matter what, we can't shut this down. Well, thankfully, people understood after a while that if you're making crap, it doesn't make it matter how much of it you make, it's still crap and it's got to be fixed. <laughs> When we look at robotics and artificial intelligence, which are two areas that are a hobby for me, sadly, but obviously in manufacturing, we know that we've done some of that in terms of you see the machines that pre-sort and do some of those things automatically. And you even can go down to the simplistic steps of every bottle cap gets put on by a machine sort of thing. Now we fast forward and there are robots that are wandering around warehouses and moving product and picking out what you're purchasing online and packaging it for you and such. Where do you see the marriage between business students now getting into that engineering side? Because we've always kept it very clear. We've had leadership and management on one side with an understanding of that engineering side. We've had engineers on the backside building all these wonderful things. But where do you see us going now as all of this continues to become one and as we start to learn to live differently? I think a lot of the technology is going to drive the ability to be efficient at small scale versus what used to be in the past, where the more you made of something at one location, the greater economies of scale that were available to you. Things like 3D printing, for example, it costs just as much to make 100 of them in one location as it does, not necessarily, but as it would be to have 100 locations being built all in one, or the volume of 100 locations built in one facility, for example. And so what you're going to find is that the person that used to be an engineer, well, they're going to have to adapt. They're going to have to be the engineer, the business person, the quality manager, the person that cleans the the restroom and every other aspect, basically. And so I do believe we're going to see more and more of a melding of what used to be very disciplined silos down into a more cross-sectional, cross-functional type of workforce. Tapping into your academic role, how do we look at changing curriculums to fit that need? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because Obviously, after coming in from 30 years of industry experience, when I found that many classes were taught where somebody pontificated from a lectern for half a semester, gave you a midterm, did the same thing for the second half, and then gave you a final exam, they had no relevance to what they were going to do in the workplace, just kind of blew my mind. It was like, well, wait a minute, this, this doesn't make sense. How can they be prepared to do what's next if they aren't doing it? an environment where if I make mistakes, it's not going to cost me my career sort of thing. 
Then the other thing was I started asking, I'm teaching management principles. How does this impact what you're teaching in your courses? And it was like, oh, don't worry about it. Just teach whatever you think you should teach. And it's like, but it has to be connected. So how, how should it be connected? And it's like, oh, no, no. We, and I had this uh, perception that when I got into academia, that everybody was going to be sitting around talking about how to make things better and how to work collaboratively and so on and so forth. And as you're well aware, I'm sure, what I found out is a bunch of faculty are often of offices doing things by themselves with no interaction with anybody else other than maybe a, a co-author or something on, on some research that they're doing. So that was one of the things that, for example, in the MBA program that I built, the faculty in that program, if they didn't want to work together, they weren't going to be part of that program. And so literally for weeks and weeks and weeks, up until the program started and then even since, we would talk about what are we doing and, and how are we going to tie all this together? So in a lot of cases, we would have assignments, for example, in marketing that would be part of the business plan that they would write later. And they wouldn't have to rewrite the business plan because they would just assemble all of the different elements from each of the courses into one comprehensive plan. But then we could see, oh, well, I said I'm going to do a million dollar marketing campaign. Well, it better show up in your financials because if it doesn't, <laughs> then there's a problem here, right? At the same time, they would always say, oh, I'm going to run the most sustainable company you've ever seen. Well, then when they start to put that into practice, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, I can't afford to do everything I want to do. So now I got to make choices about, well, how am I going to proceed with this? And so we would help them understand, well, okay, if you do this, it's easy, it's quick extra profit margin you can gain from that then can help fund the next thing and just keep doing that as you move forward. To me, our responsibility is to kind of be on the leading edge of what does society need from graduates of business programs. And so I can prepare them to go out and maybe be the leader in the area that, that they've chosen to focus on. So we have integrated sustainability into every program. Lots of companies don't have anybody with that background. You can go and be an entry-level job as a, in a management position, and suddenly you're the expert on sustainability, and you may be having a direct line to the CEO of the company. Some of what I'm focusing on now is cloud-based services. If I'm a great engineer, but I stink at doing payroll or accounting functions and so forth, well, suddenly I can farm that sort of thing out and have somebody else working on the things I'm not good at. For example, in HR, they can make sure that we're fully compliant with all a state and federal regulations and so forth. To me, it's all about whenever they hit that first job, I want them to be people I would want to hire. I found out a long time ago that I don't think I want to hire people that have been listening to lectures and doing essay questions. I want to have people that have been able to go out, see a problem, research how we could solve that problem and then go out and actually put a plan in place and make that solution happen. And so much of my career, lots of people always knew what was wrong, but there weren't very many people that could figure out what was the best solution as to how we move something from a problem to actually something that is beneficial to our organization. So a lot of what I do is around that. And of course, based on the topic of this podcast, a lot of it is also about how do we leverage that technology in the best way. So a learning management system, again, I was surprised at how many people didn't use it, but it was like, well, wait a minute, you could be so much more effective as a faculty member if you let that do some of the drudgery of grading quizzes or those sorts of things, and instead focus on creating a stronger impact in the interaction that you have with students. And then I was also all a big fan of using platforms that some of the book publishers would utilize where I could bring in some really great, like a video, for example, that was a case study that it would walk them through it, stop, ask them some questions based on their feedback, give them prompts to say, well, yeah, that could work. But if you were to answer it this way, you would have had a better opportunity to make uh, the impact that you were hoping and I'm so excited. I mean, you talk about AI and so forth and robotics and other areas, but I really want to see what that's going to do to impact education. I don't know about you, but I, I feel like we're going to move away from this. Everybody goes and spends a number of weeks together moving at the same pace to something where 
I'm going to be sitting there with some kind of AI program that's going to optimize my learning to help me move at the best possible pace to maximize my learning, to understand how it all is connected, to be able to reference me back to something I learned at an early portion in the program, and to, to have that interaction that will, to me, it, it'd be just incredible what the potential is. I think you're absolutely right. And you touched on, on a couple of things that are so important now. As we get into AI, we also start to get into virtual reality. And when you talk about watching those videos and having choices and being immersed in the actual case study, as opposed to just reading it in a one-dimensional focus, you get so much more out of it and you can see so many more things. I've had the good fortune of one time getting to do a law enforcement simulation. You can read about what happens when a deputy walks into a room and there could be a potential bad guy on the other side and you have a split second to make a decision. When you're actually in the simulation and it's going to happen to you, that is a much different experience. And you also understand the choices they have to make in a split second, which is much different than the decision you make sitting in front of a television watching the news three weeks after the fact. So I really see where virtual reality and and AI are going to be really performance enhancers for our students as we move forward. And using that technology also brings on more of an apprenticeship type feel. When you look back at the history of education, we've always had the scholars and the interns. We used to send people to apprenticeships because we didn't feel they could be scholarly enough, but we knew that they could learn a good trade and they could get into the workforce. Well, fast forward, and now we're merging those. And so now you need to be the best of both. You need to be able to have that scholarly knowledge and that logic, but you also need to be very hands-on. And technology is going to help you do that. And I especially love when you talked about the cloud, because the cloud is becoming ever-present across all of the industries. And up until now, everyone has been used to the cloud being a place to store their photos. So there's a little bit of disconnect there because all we think of it as is a giant file cabinet. And while that's a lovely thing, when you have thousands of photos, it's nice to have that. Now what we're understanding is the whole communication piece that can run through the cloud, the whole ability to manage through the cloud, both projects and people, and the ability to analyze and sort out that data that you're collecting and suddenly start to have things that are meaningful and can help you with decision-making, which all leads back to sustainability. And the fact that if you're in a cloud, you don't have a server room. That's a huge savings in sustainability because server rooms are quite costly and really not as effective as they used to be. So I think definitely there are areas there, and it's exciting to see that, that you're always thinking through the process of how to make the betterment for the student when they're going through the program And so that they are prepared when they get out, not just with the education, but also with the knowledge of how to navigate through that process. Yeah, it's obviously part of my background that I was an apprentice, right? So when I teach classes, if we're doing a strategic plan, we're doing one. We're actually working with a local company to say, hey, what what are the issues you're facing And, and so forth? I still remember going to one of our clients, and they talked to us for about 45 minutes on a Friday. Well, Monday, we came back to the classroom, and the student said, we don't know what they do. And it's like, well, there's a problem, right? Well, now (laughs) we have to go back and tell the client, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So we have to, (laughs) it's one thing to say that in a classroom where you're reading a case to say, well, no, they have a problem. But it's quite another when you actually have to go out there to the client and say face to face, hey, we think this is an area that we need to focus on. And what can we do to help you with that? I learn so much more when I'm actually doing that hands on, making my mistakes as I go along the way. And I was doing some finished carpentry work one time for my son-in-law and my daughter. And and his brother was doing some work. And he said, how did you get so good at this? And I said, one mistake at a time. I mean, I didn't start out this way. I go back to an earlier comment, right? Well, let's make those mistakes when we're a student. A, it makes it stick longer because, oh yeah, I remember when I did that. But it also helps us to be better prepared when we go out into the actual workforce. Listening to earlier podcasts that you have, they talk about the soft skills, right? Well, to me, I like calling them fundamental skills because I can't do my job if I can't write well or speak well or creative 
problem solving, or all these other things that are the, the hallmarks of a liberal arts education. I'm here to tell people they're actually part of business education as well, or engineering education, because you need all of them in order to be successful. A lot of my success is because I'm good at both. I think that's so important for our listeners because many of our folks are leaving academia, leaving business. Maybe they're retiring early, taking early buyout. Unfortunately, many people are getting laid off right now. So the thought is, do I go find another job doing exactly what I was doing before? Or do I do a startup? Do I create a business? I've always wanted to. Maybe now's a good time. But you have to have all the skills. Eventually, your business gets to a place where you can hire people to deal with a lot of those things. But in the beginning, you wear all the hats and you are responsible for everything that's there. Sure, you can contract out to get a few things done here and there, but you're also the voice of your business. And if you can't articulate what you do, and if you can't impress the potential clients you're going to work with, your business isn't going to go very far. So these skill sets are for school and also for beyond. Because it's so important, particularly when it's only your name on the line, that you're ready and that you can show them not just your knowledge and your experience, but that you can actually talk the talk, work with them, understand them, and you can communicate and articulate to them what you're bringing as value to the table. Yeah. And as you shared in an earlier conversation that we had about, you also got to make money in the end of, in, at the end of the day, right? If you're not making money, you're out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see. And right now we're seeing a lot of folks who are branching out and wanting to do things. We're seeing a lot of folks taking early retirement and starting phase two of their lives. I think even for them, oftentimes going back and getting some additional education is valuable because it's hard when you've been out for a long time. The world has changed as you go out there. And I'll share an example with everyone. I was at a conference last spring that was for startups. The majority of people there were probably under 30 years of age, probably 85% of the room. And then there was a smattering of those of us in the middle age category. And then there were a few people who were significantly older. And in talking to one of the gentlemen during break, he was 78 years old, who is now going to go out and start doing what he's calling his third career. He said, the the beauty of it is, is I have so much experience and so much knowledge and I've been so successful. And now I can share that with the world. He said, the difficulty is I haven't used technology except for my Palm Pilot, which gives you an idea of how long it's been kind of out of the technology circuit. And he said, I don't understand the navigation portion. He said, that's why I came today. He's like, I don't need help getting financing. I don't need help getting angel investors. He said, I need to understand how these young people think and what companies are looking for and how they navigate. He said, because I've been in a sheltered space and I know the corporate world easy. He said, but I'm not in the corporate world anymore. So he was quick to recognize what's the skill set I'm deficient in. And what do I need to do to make that better? And I think for all of us, it's a continuous learning process. We always have to be acknowledging and recognizing what do we need more of or what do we need to be able to do better? And then where do we go when we find that? Yeah, for example, I've been spending a lot of time website development, SEO, blogging, and and so on and so forth. It's like, I love it because I love to learn. But at the same time, I also find it beneficial because at some point, I don't want to be the guy updating my website, but I want to know what the person that's doing that for me is accomplishing and maybe what it should cost me, for example. So because I'm always probably what you would call frugal because I want value for my money sort of thing. But just the learning process itself has been beneficial because you can make a website look beautiful, but is that content actually what you're trying to portray to the, the audience? I've gone through like three iterations of my website which has also helped me to realize, well, wait a minute, I was looking at sustainability from a very broad perspective. But then the more I thought about it, it's like, well, your world is manufacturing. You need to get back to that and make that impact there. And frankly, it's an area that needs a lot of help. Again, they're having trouble finding people to fill these positions because everyone thinks that if I work for a manufacturing facility, it's a smokestack spewing nasty location that has dirt on the floors and it's going to be a sweatshop and I'm going to be doing manual labor all day. 
And it's like, no, I mean, the new manufacturing is going to be so different than anybody ever imagined. As you probably sit in a control, you may not even be at work. You might be home in your home office running a manufacturing plant from, from a remote location, right? So the AI can only do so much. They, they still need somebody to come in and do some of the other, which does tie back into what I found in much of my career is, for example, when people would implement lean manufacturing, they go, oh, wow, I can take this line that used 20 people and get it down to 15. Well, now I can fire those other five people. It's like, no, 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 that's not how you do it. You take those five people and put them somewhere else and help them to better the next line so that that line is more efficient. And then the more efficient you become, the more business you get, the more people you need to run the business. And so you're constantly lifting yourself to a higher level of performance where the old way was like, why the heck would I tell you what to do to make my job more efficient if you're going to get rid of me at the end of the day? Well, I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to look at with technology. We can't use it to replace people. It should augment people. And ultimately, even if we're having all of this technology in our workplace, we need to understand that we still have all these human, physiological, social belonging, self-esteem, self actualization needs that we need to address. And so one of the things that has come out of COVID is many people are sitting home alone with no one else to interact with, or they have maybe 10 minutes with somebody on a Zoom call on occasion. And it's like, no, 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 that, that's only going to last for so long. We really do need to always pay attention to the people side, because I don't care how much technology you have. If you don't have really good people doing the right thing, paying attention to the trends, making sure that what we provide is something that's valued by a customer, you're not going to be in business very long. I'm always disappointed in organizations I've been with that don't understand that people are the core of what it is that we do. Yeah. And I think that's especially prevalent right now because unfortunately, COVID was a wild card. And everyone thought three months and we're home free. And then it became four months and we're home free. And then it became six months and we're home free. And now we're nine months into it and we're no end in sight. So companies and smaller businesses that opened and closed and opened and closed aren't opening a third time. So those folks are losing work. Smart companies did exactly what you said. They started moving people around. They started figuring out how to do things differently. I tell the story about years ago, I worked for a place that we had to take furloughs and everyone at first said, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're going to be reduced hours and reduced funding. Then the messaging came out, which was, we don't want to lose anybody. So if everybody gives a little, we can hang on to everyone, ride the storm, and then everyone comes back full time when we can. But if we don't want to do this, then we just cut people off. So many of you will be out of a job. And then when it's great and we're back again, we'll hire new people because we're not a callback center kind of thing. Right. Explaining that to people suddenly really calmed everyone because they started to see the big picture and they started to recognize the importance of people, that the agency was concerned about us, was concerned about keeping everyone that felt that they were valued. That made a difference for people that an hour before were concerned about losing their dollars. So I agree with you totally. I love technology. You know that about me. I love good technology. I love everything new about technology. I do not think it's replaceable for people. I think it's beneficial when we're in situations like this. If you think if COVID would have happened 15 years ago, it would have been an entirely different experience. And I think we'd have been a lot worse off. People would have really been lonely and isolated, and it would have been difficult. While Zoom calls and FaceTime and all aren't the end all, at least people did get to see other people. They did get to talk. Uh, They're still doing it. And so there is a place for it. The world's changed so quickly on us. It's hard for us to imagine that this is going to be the new normal. And at the same time, still be implementing even more new things to make things better and more efficient. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, people complain about, oh, well, our, our internet connection broke up or you don't sound quite right or whatever, but it's like, and so many people don't even want to look at each other when they're doing video <laughs> conference. And it's like, why? I mean, I kind of like the fact that I can see you right now. It's just becoming comfortable with it, right? I know people that they didn't want to do anything with technology before all this happened and they were forced to do it, right? And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden it's like, oh, actually this isn't so bad. Yeah, the learning curve kind of stunk. 
I thought my wife was going to have a meltdown the first week of dealing with trying to move toddler development from face-to-face to to online. Imagine doing that with zero to three-year-olds, right? But man, she is excelling at it now. And the faculty that are the same way, a lot of people that said, oh, there's no way my course could ever be done online. Well, guess what? It had to be. And oh, wow, it did work, right? And so, but as you mentioned earlier with like virtual reality, you can now do a lab experiment that is really real in a virtual setting. It may actually be more beneficial. It's certainly probably going to be safer doing it right. It's probably even more cost effective. So I'm probably never going to be a surgeon. So I really don't need to know what it's like to put a scalpel onto a human corpse, right? But the medical people, yes, I think they do need some of that hands-on stuff. But for a lot of us, VR is going to be more than good enough. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in consulting and what type of clients you're interested in working with as you start to transition into your next phase. I did the Clifton Strength Finders thing, right? And so I've always found myself to be kind of that out of the norm kind of person. I, I did an interview one time where the person said, you're not like anybody here. It's like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, in his case, it, was, it actually was a good thing. I want to work with people that care about people. And ultimately, if you care about people, then uh, let me help you figure out ways to make your organization something that is is more beneficial to the workforce, that ultimately then you have a happier workforce. So, wow, you end up now with better customer service, customers are more satisfied, and so forth. To understand that it's not an either-or situation. I can be environmentally and socially responsible while actually making more profit at the same time. And really the primary thing is I'm not a cookie cutter kind of approach. The beauty of my past experience is I can go into any setting. What I don't know, I can go research and find out the latest and greatest on, but I can take a lot of disparate parts that other people can't see how to fit them all together. And I can help you do that. So clients that want to make a difference, want to be a better operation for all their stakeholders, not just for their shareholders, and that are looking for somebody that can make it, help them make a, a difference and grow and expand beyond what they know now that can be uncomfortable at times with what we might be suggesting that, oh, there's no way that can work. Well, no, let's give it a try. I bet it can. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to work with people I like. If I don't like you, yeah, it's not going to But that's one of the nice things about consulting. Well, I don't like you much, but okay, we can sever this contract at at the conclusion or this relationship at the conclusion of the contract. And then I can go on and try to find somebody else that I do like working with more. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely about fit. And I think uh, that's something that's always important for our listeners also, especially if they're doing their own business where they're not hiring full-time employees yet. And they're out searching for people to do contract work and consulting work to help them with specific problems is it has to be a good fit. As a consultant, you want to be the best you can be for that organization or that client. And you want to feel like you're contributing to them and vice versa. They want to feel like they can trust you, like they feel like they've tapped into the right knowledge base, but also just that you can have the frank conversations. I tell people it's the difference between having a frank conversation with a good friend and having a frank conversation with someone standing in a store. You wouldn't walk up to someone in a store and say something that might be detrimental or harmful or hurt their feelings. You can say that to someone that's a good friend because they recognize that there's more to it than that. There's a deeper level of acknowledgement and there's a relationship that is beneath that so that you can have those frank conversations. And as consultants, sometimes we have to be very direct and we have to say when something isn't working well or something isn't right. We have to point out we're always the bad guys. We have to say, you can do that decision, but down the road, this is likely what the outcome could be from this. You just need to be aware of it. So I think it always comes back to people, no matter how much technology we have, no matter how many skill sets we have, no matter how many opportunities we have to grow and change and do things with AI and such, it still all comes back to people. And that's the core. Yes, it does. And the people that understand that it is about the people, I think that would be a common element at any company that's very successful, right? They understand the value that that brings to the table and treat them appropriately. So I also find that humor is one of the ways to help work through some of those difficult situations as well, because 
I can make a jovial comment about something. And I think sometimes that plants a seed where they're like, oh, well, he didn't call me out on that, but he did send a message. And then it gives them a chance to think about it. Or one of the other favorite things to do was to kind of do that on a Friday. And then they'd go home and, and complain to their partner that, oh, well, so-and-so said this about, oh, well, yeah, it's true. I mean, you do that. <laughs> so that then by the time they came back on Monday, well, they might not say it, but at least they had a better understanding that it's not just me that sees this, it's other people. Absolutely. Joe, what is your website? For Mary Baldwin University, it's marybaldwinuniversity.edu to see the programs that we offer. And from a consulting perspective and the blog posts that I do weekly, you can find that at emmanuelstrategicsustainability.com. Okay. And we will be listing those on our podcast sites. Joe, I want to thank you for joining me today. This has been an exciting conversation. And I do think this is one we're going to have to come back in the spring and have a part two, because I think as we keep navigating the pandemic situation. And as we start to see more of big companies are going to start to change what we're doing and how we're doing it, this is definitely going to be worth having a second conversation on. So, Anytime. I would welcome it. It's been a pleasure. Wonderful. I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us today. And I want to make sure that you recognize that we are available on Amazon, Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher. We really hope you enjoyed this edition of EdTech Speaks and can make use of the information. And we look forward to having you join us again. For more information on our organization, reach out to us at www.downingedtech.com or follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Until next time, keep learning. Thank you for listening to EdTech Speaks with EdTech strategist Cher Downing. To learn more about the services Downing EdTech and its staff can provide you, find us at www.downingedtech.com. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to share it. We'd also like to hear from you regarding any suggestions for topics or guests and the value you received from our show. Check back for new podcasts with featured guests at www.downingedtech.com podcast. Thank you.